Okay, let's get the live, Facebook live going. Interesting. Whole different browser. Says it's coming up though. Facebook Live. Should ask me for the title now. It does. Okay. says we're now live on Facebook. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Here we are again. Another week has passed. This seems like a couple of days ago, and here we are, a whole new week. I did, by the way, get a new camera, <laughs> and uh, I plugged it in, and it worked, and then this morning I tested it, and it didn't work. I'm going to butt my button here. All right. So, uh, back to the old camera, and I'm still now on the red side. Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to be again in uh, the book of the Song of Solomon, uh, an event that takes place now after the marriage, okay? And uh, this morning, as always, I'd like to start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we like to come before you and thank you for all your wonderful, wonderful gifts. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be active and involved as we read and study your word, that we would learn from you that only your Holy Spirit can provide for us. We ask for your help in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Redeemer. Amen. Okay. Well, last week we uh, were talking about getting up to the wedding and the wedding, you know, the Song of Solomon, of course, is about King Solomon and his wife, the Sulamite woman, right? And uh, they keep expressing how much they love each other, right? Well, in chapter five, we have a description of an event that takes place after the wedding. Now, your relationships are frequently difficult, whether it's a marriage relationship, a friend relationship, right? Uh, and of course, the whole concept of the marriage relationship is an analogy of the relationship we should each have with the Lord God, right? So we'll have some more conversation about that in a little bit. But uh, as we are here in uh, in chapter 5, our focal point begins in verse 6. And starts off with, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and had gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him and I did not find him. I called him. He did not answer me. Now, you know, earlier we had a situation where she had had a dream that he was not there, right? And she went out into the streets looking for him and the watchmen were, you know, helping her, et cetera, right? And this may be another dream, but it may also be a real occurrence, you know, demonstrating that even after you're married, no matter how much you love each other, the relationship still needs to work and you need to work on that relationship. You know, when we're young, we invest in whether it's education or cars or, you know, whatever. And when we get older, we invest in, you know, mutual funds or Bitcoin or <laughs> whatever different things as we prepare for our retirement and whatnot. 
but our relationships are still something that we have to invest in throughout our life. And the same thing is true with our relationship, not just with our spouse, but with our friends, with our children, right? And with our God, we should never forget about investing in our relationship, you know, with our God, which starts with simply talking to him, right? We always call it prayer. You know, but Paul told us to pray without ceasing. You know, we can talk to God mentally anytime, all the time. We should always have that connection, right? With our spouse, right, we have the situation where, you know, things can happen that kind of drive a little wedge, you know, and, you know, with our, again, with our children or with our friends or, you know, something happens that can drive a wedge in there. And that's what she's saying here. Something's happened. We don't know if his feelings got hurt and he's not there. You know, uh, and women would be amazed if they knew how fragile the male ego actually was, right? But uh, something's happened. Now, remember, he's King Solomon, too. He's running the kingdom. Maybe he's just off on business. Maybe he's doing something he needs to do with that. We don't really know. We just know he's not there and what, how this now makes her feel. So she's dealing with this absence, right? Because a relationship not only needs to have the physical connection, right? Time together. But we also need the emotional connection, the support that we can give each other. It's so important, you know, that we provide that kind of support by letting our spouse know how much we love them and respect them, admire them, etc. right? And vice versa, you know, both sides need to pitch in on that, right? Everybody, especially, you know, men need those little ego strokes, you know, that uh, says that we are somebody that's important, at least to our spouse, right? So anyway, she's saying he's not there. We don't know why, we don't know where, we don't even know if this is a dream, right? But point is, he's not there. She's calling, he's not answering. Then she says, the watchmen who made the rounds in the city found me, but this time instead of helping her, right, to find her husband, to find Solomon, right? At that time it was her uh, fiance. Now it's her husband, right? says, they struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. You know, kind of implying they were trying to rape her. We don't know what was going on, but it wasn't a good ordeal, and it certainly was not help, right? We're not sure what happened there. But something uh, negative, very negative, happened when she's trying to find her husband. So, you know, now, why is she out in the streets again, right? In the dream, it's one thing, right? In real life, it's a whole nother. It's a big problem to be out in the streets, right? Yeah. You know? And then she says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, right? So she's asking the, 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 the maidens of Jerusalem to take an oath, <laughs> right? So she's recruiting help to find him. It says, if you find my beloved, and that means either actively search for, or if you come upon him, either way, if you find my husband, right, my beloved, as to what to tell him, for I am lovesick, right? <laughs> she is uh, uh, really, really missing him, right? And She's trying to recruit help to go out, excuse me, you know, and, and help her find Solomon, right? And I wonder if this isn't a dream because she would know that as the king, right, he'd have things to do and she would probably know where to go to find him, right? I don't know. So I'm thinking this might fall in that category, right? 
but she's lovesick, right? She has physical needs. She needs her husband in her presence. She has emotional needs, you know, like we all do, right? And she needs his support and she's not getting it right now, right? You know, I don't know if anybody have ever studied the, the, the love languages, but, <laughs> you know, some people, their love language is simply time together, right? Other ones, it's verbal support. Some others, it's gifts, right? You know, different people see uh, that you love them by how you act, and we see it in different ways, right? So in this case, you know, we, we know that she's missing him big time. Right? So what kind of beloved is your beloved? So the maidens now are asking a question, okay? They're not immediately jumping on board with, oh, well, yeah, we'll certainly uh, help you find him, look for him, if we see him, you know, et cetera. They're saying, well, tell me about him. You know, oh, most beautiful among women, because she was obviously known for how beautiful she was. What kind of beloved is your beloved? that thus you adjure us. Why do you ask us, right? So they're causing her to think back and remember all the things about Solomon that were part of her love for him, right? So she starts to remember. These next verses are all about that. She says, my beloved is dazzling and ruddy, or he's fit and strong, right? Outstanding among 10,000, right? She says he's better looking than just about anybody, right? His head is like gold, pure gold, right? In other words, not only does he look good, but it, it probably represents his wisdom. And of course, Solomon was known for the wisdom that God had provided him, right? His head was like pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as ravens, <laughs> right? So it's showing that his hair was black, right? <laughs> kind of shiny black, like a raven is, you know? Of course, ravens are usually, in Jewish culture, were considered a very negative thing, but, but they did have very black, shiny, you know, leaves. Not leaves, feathers. <laughs> His eyes are like doves. You know, doves are known for being very, very faithful. So I think she's pointing out here the analogy that he is faithful, right? But eyes also are so important because they provide sight, right? His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. So it's kind of like gems, you know, sitting in the, in the milk, right? His cheeks are like a bed of balsam right? So she's changed here from things that you see now to things that you smell, right? You know, his cheeks, like a bed of balsam, banks of sweet scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh, right? Now, this is a rare herb, pretty much reserved for royalty. And of course, King Solomon is the king, royalty, right? And so she's remembering how not only did he appear to her, but how he would smell when she was next to him. And she's remembering all of this, right? His hands are rods of gold set in barrel, right? Now, the Hebrew hands is not just your hand, but it means from your shoulder down, you know, it's the whole thing right? But his hands are rods of gold, right? Uh, set in barrel, his abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphire. So <laughs> again, she, now Solomon, you know, may have had as the king bracelets and things with all kinds of jewels, etc. on, you know, on his arms when he was dressed, etc. as the king, right? And she's remembering all this stuff. And, and then she says his legs are pillars of alabaster like marble right set on pedestal so they're on a base so, so he very strong very very stable so she's remembering him in that fashion right and uh 
His appearance is like Lebanon choice as the cedars. You know, in scripture, we read a lot about the cedars of Lebanon, the tall cedar, towering cedar trees in Lebanon. And where did the wood come from to build the temple? Lebanon, right? Now, I don't know what the deal is, but today there are no cedar trees in Lebanon that I'm aware of. <laughs> we never hear about the cedars of Lebanon anymore. Whereas in scripture, it was renowned, the cedars of Lebanon, right? <laughs> Everybody knew about the cedar trees, you know, in Lebanon. So, but she's talking about him there, that his appearance, that he's big and strong and, you know, stable, like the cedars of Lebanon, right? So she's remembering all these things about Solomon, the one she loves, right? And, she, you know, so these maidens had caused her to stop and think about this. You know, in our relationships, how often do we stop and remember, right? You know, I mean, do we really set aside time to just be with our spouse? Or are we all so busy trying to get things done, et cetera, and then burn ourselves out when you get home, all you do is, you know, collapse and watch TV. I've, I've had that happen to me uh, many times, right? You know, we have to make sure we set aside time to be with our spouse, to literally go on dates with our spouse, right? To do things together. Otherwise, things deteriorate, right? And that's what she's saying. Something's happened. You know, we don't have detail and it doesn't matter because there's so many different kinds of things that can happen, right? That interfere with our relationship. Like say, this we're talking about is marriage relationship, but relationships also is true with our children and with our friends, you know, what can interfere, right? Sometimes our uh, children are to do something that we don't like. And how do we react? Do we just let it go? Or do we say something, right? And how tactful are we when we say it? The same thing with friends, you know? And if something happens that interferes in our relationship, do we just let it fester? Or do we address it? Do we try to reach a resolution, you know, so our friendship can move forward, right? And then back to our relationship with God. How is our behavior and our connection with our creator? How often do we actually speak with God? And do we do it in reverence? You know, after all, he is God and we are his creation. Right? So as we're dealing with all the stuff that happens in life. And, you know, we all know a lot of stuff happens. You know, crap happens to everybody. You know, sometimes there's good stuff, but a lot of times there's bad stuff that happens to us, right? And we have to deal with it. You know, and do we let that affect how we relate with the people that we have relationships with and especially with our God. You know, something bad happens, do we blame God? Right? Uh, heaven forbid that we would blame our spouse, right? You know, but there are things that just happen in life that cause issues and, and we have to handle them, right? And of course, we just went through the book of Proverbs where we're talking about wisdom, you know, and getting wisdom from God and, and helping us so we can deal with issues in our life, right, with wisdom and not just with our own thinking, but wisdom that God provides us, right? That's something that we need to focus on, right, uh, to help us deal with everything in our life. And then as we're dealing with those things, with the wisdom that comes from God, then it makes it a lot easier to handle these situations. But we have to take the time, right, to invest in those relationships, you know, with our spouse especially, but with our ch children, with our friends, and of course, with our God. 
right? And so she's got all this she's remembering, you know, do we remember, you know, when we met our spouse and how we fell in love and then got married, et cetera? You know, how often do we recollect those things? And that's what she's recollecting, right? Or how often do we think about when God reached down and sent his Holy Spirit and convicted us of our sin, causing us to convert, right? To accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you know? So because of what God did, you know, we're now saved. Because of what Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago and paid the price for our sins, we now can be saved, right? Do we recollect that, you know? Songs, music has a way of really stirring, you know, emotions, you know, and songs that cause us to recollect those things in our life, whether it be the romantic relationships, you know, or our Christian <laughs> relationship, right? Those songs can really be beneficial. You know, I have a CD I have not listened to in a little while because I had loaned it out. But not once have I listened to that music on that CD without breaking down into tears. Not one time. And I've probably heard it 50 times, right? Because of what God has done for me. It just, you know, mind boggling, right? You know, let's move on to verse 16 real quick. His mouth is full of sweetness. So now she's talking about his mouth, right? So it's probably the words that coming out of his mouth that she's referring to as his sweetness, where she, where he is describing her. And we've got a lot of verses in, in Song of Solomon where he's described how beautiful she is and, you know, et cetera, both inside and outside, physically and as a person of character, right? And he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved. And this is my friend, right? Best friend, right? This is my beloved. This this word is the you know word for romantic love, right? In the Hebrew, not agape in the Greek, you know, which is God's love for us, which is completely unconditional love, right? You know, oh daughters of Jerusalem. So she's describing to the maidens why you know she loves him so much. You know, she's they have caused her to remember all of this, right? And so now, of course, he, he comes back, et cetera, and it goes, you know, and I'm not sure what happens to them uh, going forward. We know he ends up with a thousand women, literally 700 wives and 300 concubines. And, you know, but maybe this one is the one he spends most of his time with, you know, can't answer that question. <laughs> you know, God can at some point when we get to heaven, I guess, but I don't know. You know, the question is, when we stop and think about all the great things about our spouse or our friends, our children, etc., you know, what is it about them that we really, really appreciate? It brings, it stirs back in us, you know, the love that we have for them. And we need to remember those things. And don't let little things that create division keep us from focusing on the good things, right? I have a saying that the Lord gave me a long time ago that people need to not concern themselves with what they think they're not getting in their relationship, but focus on what are they giving to the relationship. Think about that for a while and see if, which side of the fence are you on. How often do spouses, and I'll say this, uh, that appears to be the case that women more than men, but both do it, spend most of their time with their friends complaining about their spouse. 
rather than as she did here, talking about all the positives of that relationship with her spouse, why she loves him so much, right? I uh, think I've done a pretty good job in that area. I never say negative things about my wife. I don't think anybody can ever remember a time where I've made a negative comment, right? Not something that I think would be productive. So I've made a habit of not doing that. Now, have I said enough positive things? Probably not, <laughs> right? You know, which side of the fence are we on in that area? And then back to our relationship with God, when we stop and think about the God who created the heavens and the earth just by speaking, just speaking, right? This God chooses to love us, chooses to come to earth as a man. You see, that's kind of like us becoming an ant, <laughs> right? And then dying on the cross, all the suffering, taking on all our sins, paying the price for our sin. The eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing creator God did this unbelievably remarkable thing for us. How on earth can we refuse that gift? I praise God that the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of me, right? <laughs> Turned me around and I accepted that gift, making me a Christian. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's Christianity. It's not works-based in any way, shape, or form, which all religions are, right? It's Christ based. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ, the second person in the Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, which is one God, mm -hmm. right? So I pray for all of you, anybody who hears this message, that the Holy Spirit would get a hold of your heart and cause you to realize what a unbelievable gift God is giving you and that you will accept that gift so you can spend eternity in heaven eternity with God as opposed to the opposite and only other place to go unfortunately is to hell eternity without God in punishment for refusing the infinite gift you get infinite punishment Anyway, that is our lesson in Song of Solomon about relationships, you know, both in our marital relationship as the example is in chapter five, right? But <clears throat> our relationship with our creator God. Father in heaven, as always, it's amazing beyond description what you've done for us. I can't begin to understand it, but I appreciate it. I thank you. And I ask, Lord, again, that anyone hearing this message would accept that gift and become a Christian. So easy just to say, Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart. Be Lord and Savior of my life. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, that's our lesson for today. And that will finish up our study in the uh, Song of Solomon or Song of Songs. And I pray that everybody has a great week. And I appreciate you and love you. Thank you very much.